for many qualitative researchers, qualitative research starts with epistemology. And a very important part in epistemology is thinking about subjectivity. How subjective is this research? How subjective am I as a researcher? And it's often contrasted to more objective or realist forms of research. And a good practice in order to do more or less subjective research is reflexivity. And reflexivity is not just sitting and ponder, it's sitting and ponder about research, probably about a reality out there and how you as a researcher co-constructs this reality, as subtle realist would say. Clive Seale distinguishes three types of reflexivity. Personal, about yourself. Methodological, about your method. And third, theoretical, about your theory. So let's start with the first one, this personal reflexivity. Reflexivity as a confession, but then a personal confession. I use this word confession because of the work of Max von Manehus, who wrote about the difference between confessional tales and realist tales. In realist tales, people present the world out there as objective. Researchers present the world out there as objective. In a confessional tale, researchers present the world out there as probably co-constructed or constructed, and they write about themselves as researchers getting into the field, dealing with hardships, dealing with difficult situations, but also very positive and easy situations, but how they as researchers informed their research. And for Mana says that people use these, these confessions, these reflections about themselves um, in order to, to follow uh, different purposes. The first purpose many people would claim they do is they downgrade authority. So many people would say, I came into this field with this and this background and that influenced my research in such a way. I'm a young man, very pretty and so on, and therefore I influenced my field in such a way. And Vamana shows that people do this, downgrading authority, or at least they say they do this, but in, in fact they are claiming authority rather than downgrading authority. Look how I did my field work. It was the only possible way to do this field work. And Due to my heroship, uh, my heroism, I came to these results. So that's about reflection as something personal, a personal confession. The second form of reflexivity is reflexivity on your methods, on your methodology. So not on you as a person, but on how you used your methods. And there are different reasons why you do this. The first reason is you do this in order to remind yourself about your working hypotheses, or you remind yourself about the procedures you've taken and the interpretations you've written. You use it as some sort of field notes, methodological field notes, memos, as they're often called. So what brilliant abduction did you do? What brilliant interpretations did you do? And you note those in order to go back to them later. The second reason why people use these, these reflexivities, reflections on methods, is for the reason Coffey and Atkinson draw out. And they say, well, reflections, their documentation is part of the transformation of data from personal experiences and intuition to public and accountable knowledge. So what they mean is that from these intuition, in, intuitions and gut feelings, you transform these gut feelings into accountable data by showing what procedures you've taken, what steps you sta you've taken. And it's not window dressing per se, it can be, but it is the way how we deal with knowledge. We have some gut feelings, we have some ideas, we test them, but we write it down properly in order to make it accountable and public. The third reason why we use this methodological reflexivity is 
to create something like an audit trail. And an audit trail, as it was suggested by Halpern and later made big by Gubern Linkel, this audit trail deals with transparency. You have to be, as a researcher, as transparent as possible, Halpern says, and you have to make your data and your theories and your methods auditable, which means you have to write down what steps you took what procedures you took, why you made certain choices, why you did interviews with these people and not with others, why you observed that social situation and not another social situation. So about your, the choices you've made when selecting people, when analyzing, when reviewing your material, when testing your hypotheses, if you do that, and so on and so forth, in order to create the possibility for others to check your work. The third way you can use reflexivity is again as a confession, but then a theoretical confession. And this is a hard form of reflection because what you do when you do this about theory, you display your theoretical orientation. You show what assumptions you have, what your prejudice is, what, what biases you have, and so on and so forth. But some people would say, this is pretty impossible. Why? Well, since these are biases, you probably don't know that you have those biases, as Clive Seal put it. So therefore, people say it's more ambitious than a methodological or a personal reflexivity because, well, you're talking about your blind spots. And since they're blind spots, you cannot see them. 